everyone. Welcome to the Still To Be Determined podcast. This is the podcast that follows up on topics from the YouTube channel Undecided with Matt Farrell. I, as you may know already, am not Matt Farrell. I'm Sean Farrell. I'm Matt's older brother. I'm a writer. I'll be asking the questions. With me is, of course, Matt. Matt, say hello. Hello. We also have a, another guest with us today. It's Rob Vanderweil. Rob, say hi. Hi there. Nice to be here. And uh, people who are regular listeners or viewers are probably scratching their heads saying, Matt, Sean, it's usually just two bald men. (laughs) We're branching out. We're trying to bring in all the bald men. So, (laughs) And Rob is here because he lended a hand uh, in crafting the episode with Matt. So he has another perspective to add to the conversation. And we're looking forward to talking to him about this. Today's episode, we're going to be focusing on Matt's most recent episode, which was titled Solar Panels Plus Farming? Question mark? Always a question mark. (laughs) Agrivoltaics Explain. And this was from October 5th, 2021. And right off the bat, I saw in the comments, there was a lot of very positive response to this. This is an idea that really seems to hit uh, an intersection of needs in a very unique way so the public response seems to be this is great but as you point out there is a lot of pressure pushing back the other direction from people who are concerned about things changing in their environment where they live in ways that might impact their lives and sadly governmental bureaucracy which just hasn't caught up to being able to bring this into communities in a way that makes sense. And I'm wondering from both of you, do you get a sense that those two things are actually one thing? Is there public pressure being put on politicians to keep things the way they are? Or is there a lack of movement by government that is allowing for concretized thinking to stay in place? Curious what you think, Rob. Well, it, it, I think it depends on where you live. Um, where I live, uh, our governments, uh, especially in the, in the EU, are actually very open to these kinds of concepts, but they struggle to give this, these concepts a proper place. And it has all, all to do with uh, current regulations and current ways of uh, land use and, and the way that we even uh, work with them. Um, you, you might have seen in, uh, in, in the video that there is some regulation that uh, the EU has that actually subsidizes uh, land use for um, agriculture. Right. And if, if you put something else on that land, that subsidy, um, that, that might go away. So it's a thorny uh, subject there at that, yeah. at that point. But I guess that in other places in the world that, it's an entirely different ball game. Yeah, I think here in the U.S., it's mainly the free market, which seems to rule everything here. And there's a conservative bent that doesn't. I don't think there's a cabal that's working against something like this. I think it's just a slow-moving reality that we're watching unfold. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's not a lot of government support pushing it yet. And do you think that it's a matter of public education mainly? Like getting getting this information out in in front of the public to allow people to see what would this look like. Like one of the things that you point out is, I love that there's a parallel between the high tech version of farming raspberries and the low tech version. Both of them need to protect the plants. One of them is just using plastic tarps. The other one with solar panels, it really doesn't change the product underneath. It really it, it solves certain problems like you mentioned the workers have better shade the plants are better protected in case of larger storms that's a kind of image of what this kind of farming could look like that really isn't one that people would have if they were just told what would you think about putting solar panels on a farm right yeah, I, I do think there's a, there's a public education angle to this that needs to happen. Um, I was just talking to Rob before the call of, uh, I just saw a story about uh, in France, they're becoming more of a semi-arid 
climate region. Mm-hmm. And it's been impacting the uh, vineyards and the grapes that they're growing. And there was this story I saw about the agrivoltaics over a vineyard and how his grapes were, you know, plump and healthy compared to the non agrivoltaic right. crops in the area. And so it's like, this has a huge impact on farming in different regions, depending on where you live. Mm-hmm. And I think there's just a, I don't think the public knows about it. I don't think a lot of, maybe a lot of people in government don't know about this. So it's like, I do think that there's a, mm-hmm. an education that has to happen more broadly. So people know that this is a thing that we should be looking into more and right. studying more closely. Cause Rob, correct me if I'm wrong. This is still early days as far this, as the this studies. Is, this is very early days. Yeah. Uh, just, just a few years on the road we are with this concept. Mm-hmm. And it, 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 it seems that for certain crops, this is a fantastic solution. And for other types of crops, it's, it's just not feasible. It's, it's, um, it's, it's not a one size fits all solution. It's a solution that, that can benefit certain kinds of agriculture uh, more than others. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, great. The, 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 the company Groenleven, uh, which did the, did these projects and which we showcased uh, with the raspberry farm. They also are doing uh, projects with uh, strawberries and uh, other kinds of berries, uh, uh, especially uh, uh, fruits that are uh, originally coming from um, uh, forest areas uh, and uh, uh, sh- shade uh, loving uh, fruits, but they need to have sun uh, once in a while. And uh, they don't tend to grow very high, and that makes it easy to to just make a canopy uh, of, of solar um, panels above them, and and it it it, it creates an interesting and uh, a quite stable environment for those plants. So, in that case, it's a interesting use case. But for other for other types of crop, um, it, it it might just not not be feasible to do it. Yeah, I was struck by the some of the imagery in the video that was used was clearly you you know you I know Matt you go and get stock video from various sources to be able to fill in imagery and it doesn't necessarily mean when you show an image this is a case where this is going to take place or where it makes sense necessarily. Some of the crops that you showed things like corn there are going to be complications depending on the size of the crop. Mm -hmm. If something is, uh, if we're talking about a farm that is, let's say an orchard that is growing apples, oranges, that kind of crop, this isn't necessarily going to be like, well, let's just put solar panels above those trees. This is not going to be that kind of thing. Right. There's, there's like Rob pointed out, there's certain crops where not just from how much sun they need, but also from the size, shape and how we cultivate those crops that may not make sense. But this is one of those things of we have to study this. We have to do this more and try it out and see what works and what doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And there's also, I have a video coming up on transparent solar panels that's coming up. And that technology could have a huge impact on this kind of thing as well. Because as as we highlighted in this video, which was the, the, the farmer, they tried different types of solar panels and discovered this one panel blocks too much light. They had to use a different one that let a little more light through. If you have transparent solar panels, you could like finely tune how much light is being allowed through and the t- and the spectrum of light that's being allowed through. Mm-hmm. So I have a feeling like in the next 10, 20 years, this is going to get refined to a point where it's going to be kind of astounding. And some of these transparent solar panels are already being used on greenhouses. So right. th- there's, there's a path forward that's really interesting here. Yeah. And that, I was it, wondering about that as well. Is this heading toward more greenhouse agriculture than what would be I don't know. considered outdoor agriculture? I mean, th- there's so many things like <laughs> I've also talked about uh, vertical farming <laughs> in a different video. It's like there seems like this there's a sweet spot of like you get transparent solar panels that are providing the power for vertical farming systems inside of a building and all this kind of stuff. So there's different angles that could be taken here and different combinations of things that mm-hmm. it's like Lego blocks. It's like, but we're at the very early days of what all this means and how we can use these different things together in different ways. Yeah. Right. The, the company Groenleven, uh, uh, they explained to me when I visited uh, their uh, their farm in Babberich that uh, they chose for just regular solar panels because they th- those are the cheapest ones to get. Right. And it's already a little bit more expensive to uh, create those constructions. And they can't put as many uh, solar panels 
in in the same area to to generate that amount of uh, energy that they could if they were just solely uh, solar panels but they're just uh, cramming together two two technologies to see what's uh, what's possible and of course we can optimize it but just with current simple uh, already proven technology we can already do uh, a lot of things and it, it can be sustainable and it, it can be profitable as well and that was a real surprise for me to see that yeah and the, the the facility that we highlighted in the video you rob actually visited and the thing i find fascinating about that one is not only did they choose the panels that were obviously the cheapest but they didn't use motorized like movements and articulating panels because that one that probably also increases the cost makes it more complicated and the system they have is like the most rudimentary way you could do this and to test it and to test the feasibility i thought it was really fascinating they didn't go with that approach because some of the mm -hmm. other ones i've come across like this one in france that over the vineyards they were using the motorized articulated panels to adjust exactly how much sun was being allowed through at right. different times of the day and th while that works that increases the cost and you've mentioned that Rob actually visited one of these locations. So I want to kind of take a step backward now and visit the technical putting together of this video. Yeah. Rob, how did you come into this project with Matt? Was this something, Matt, that you had a project that you were working on and Rob kind of surfaced and said, hey, I know a little bit about that or I can be a contact. How did the <laughs> two of you start working on this collaboratively? Well, it, what's funny is I had agrivoltaics on my backlog of ideas to hit at some point, but Rob reached out to me. And why, why don't you tell the story, Rob? <laughs> well, uh, it's it, it, it's a, a series of coincidences. Um, yeah. um, I'm, uh, I'm 54 years old, and uh, five years ago, I decided to engage in a bachelor's study on environmental sciences. Mm. And uh, one of the uh, courses I did was on environmentally improved production. And uh, as a uh, course uh, assignment, I needed to write an essay on something that is related to environmentally improved production. So I chose the subject of agrivoltaics because I th thought it might be an interesting uh, subject to investigate. So I did a lot of uh, research. I wrote my essay and um, I thought about that. Oh, that, 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 that's something that might actually uh, fit uh, on the channel from, uh, from Undecider, from Matt. <laughs> so s since I'm a, a Patreon producer uh, from the, the first hour already, yeah. <laughs> um, I just reached out and said, how do you feel like uh, let's make a, a video together? And, um, well, that, that uh, Matt was open to it, so I wrote a script. Um, it was twice as large as the actual video. Uh, <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was very long. <laughs> it, it, uh, because I think there's a lot, lot to tell about this subject. And it was very much fun working with Matt to, 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 to get this subject in, 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 in 12 minutes and... Um, even uh, uh, get some fun and humor in it, um, <laughs> which, which is not my forte, but uh, Matt, Matt is very good at it. <laughs> yes. I, I think he just created the meme, just like me. Yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I particularly and enjoyed that, that, the, uh, finding out that went. cows hate solar panels. That was my favorite yeah. part. Yeah. <laughs> There was actually somebody who who commented on it in 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 the video, and he 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 thought we were serious. So I res I responded, <laughs> okay, that was a joke. Yeah, <laughs> I may have been a little too deadpan in my delivery yeah. of that joke. <laughs> <laughs> so, that, so that's how you it went, went through a first draft, and you pared it down to fit into a twelve minute video. Mm -hmm. um, and then you actually visit the site. So do you want to talk a little bit about where in Europe you live and how? what was the ease of your being able to visit these locations? Well, um, you might have guessed that I'm from the Netherlands, <laughs> a small country in the northwest of Europe. And, um, well, this, this particular farm is just a, a one-hour drive from my home, so it was very easy to visit it. And I reached out to the farm uh, because I was interested for my essay in in, in having some taking some pictures and mm -hmm. getting to, to 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 get some first-hand experience there. And uh, they responded, "Okay, we get so many questions for visits, but um, 
in a in, in a few weeks' time, uh, we have a, a a slot where we invite a lot of people who are interested. Uh, you can come on that date, and then we will give you a tour. And that tour was was done not just by the farmer, but also by the company who owns the uh, solar panels, who installed the solar panels. Mm-hmm. And um, it, was, it was very easy for me to get there. So I, I made some footage that also appeared in the video. Yep. Those were the, the footage where Groenleven was not credited. That was my footage. <laughs> and uh, just, just a couple of pictures and, and some, uh, some short videos on, uh, on, on both sides of the, uh, of the farm. Eh? So the, mm-hmm. the plastic part and the, the solar part. So it, it was actually quite... Um, accessible for me because you know it's just one hour drive from where I live. And I'm curious, how long has the farm been using this tech? You, you mentioned that you started doing the the bachelor degree. Was it five years ago? You said, uh, yeah, in 2017 I started. Right, so you it, had to write this paper my, when? Well, I, I wrote it just this summer. And okay. the, this farm was uh, uh, starting with this project in 2019. So it was actually quite fresh on the radar, to, uh, okay. to, to put it that way. Yeah. And I'm curious about the growing season there. Here in the U.S., in the news this past uh, summer, the past few months, there's been some things that have been percolating in the news about how various cities in the U S are effectively being reclassified as far as what, what zone, what environmental zone they live in. Like I live in New York city. We are now considered subtropical. So that's a, that's a pretty big change. And that's an impact that's hitting farms across the country is, as this video talks about in particular and Matt and you have talked about already in this recording of the impact in changes in weather patterns in the Netherlands, what kinds of changes have you seen there? Are you seeing rising temperatures or longer raining seasons? Is there is there something that's going on there that this kind of technology might help mitigate? Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> uh, we are uh, in, a, in a moderate climate here. Um, you know, we, t- uh, we are uh, close to the uh, um, Atlantic Ocean. And... Um, what we are facing here is that we get um, more hot summers. Um, we get uh, milder winters. But in those hot summers, we also get um, more extreme weather, more mm-hmm. extreme hail, more extreme uh, rain, all this kinds of stuff. So, uh, for instance, the, the, the damage that this farmer um, usually has ju- uh, during summer storms uh, was... In in, in, in 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 the past decade was negligible uh, mm-hmm. once in a few years uh, his his uh, his plastic canopies were destroyed mm-hmm. but now it happens almost every year um, mm-hmm. and 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 those storms and those hails they intensify I'm, I'm, I don't know if you've seen it in the news but we are now also getting floods here and um, yeah. it it, it, it the point with um, with global warming is that the air becomes warmer and a warm air can retain more um, water than cold air. So there is more water in the air and it gets released once in a while mm-hmm. in, 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 in ways that we haven't seen um, for a long time. So that's really a, a, a benefit for this this type of agriculture because uh, it, they can have a growing season um, in, in, in summer and, and, and an entire uh, crop yield can be destroyed just by one storm. Right. And that's something that uh, um, this, this typical dissolution uh, helps to prevent. Yeah. The, the other thing about it is I, I love the symbiotic relationship you get between the crops and the panels Yeah, because the panels can reduce the temperature by one to two degrees Celsius which can help the crops as the climate shifts and gets warmer and hotter and more humid. Mm-hmm. And then it also helps the panels because the crops actually keep the panels cooler, right? which makes their operations more efficient. So it's like this wonderful little symbiotic relationship that ha- happens between the two. Yeah. yeah. The, the, the farmer told me that uh, beneath the solar panels, uh, compared with the plastic uh, canopies, 
um, there was a temperature difference of uh, seven degrees Celsius. So I don't know wow, what that's, wow. that's in that's... Fahrenheit, but that's actually a lot. And um, that was not just nice for the uh, the workers yeah, who had to harvest. All those raspberries have to be harvested manually yep, yeah. because it's a very delicate fruit. Um, but um, those plants, they suffer um, uh, much more heat stress and they have to use way more water uh, under the plastic canopies. And the, those plastic canopies, they, they need to be there to give shade, to protect them from uh, hail and rain, and those kinds of to protect them from the elements. Right. But also those, those plastic canopies, they are translucent. So they let the light through and they still get the light. And with the solar panels, the same thing happens, but um, it, it's a more sturdier uh, canopy for them. Yeah, that's, that's actually, really remarkable. That the I was going to say, there, there's one other aspect of this that always strikes me. The more videos I do of the, than this, the one issue that I'm becoming more and more concerned with over time is uh, accessibility to clean, fresh water, and mm -hmm. it's becoming it's clear that we are going to have a major water problem in our future. Mm -hmm. And so it's like being able to reduce how much water it takes to maintain our crops is essential. And right. the crops that grow under panels like this, they take less water. And that's a, a key thing that we need to focus on. Yeah. And they are also a very good um, uh, drainage uh, solution. Yeah. <clears throat> because the water falls between the rows and not on the plants. Right. So the, 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 those raspberries, they are not grown in the soil. They are grown in pots. <laughs> so uh, the, the, uh, the soil beneath them uh, is it, it, not, um, uh, how, do you, how do you say that? Um, it, 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 it doesn't uh, uh, flow away when it rains uh, uh, very hard. And those, those crops still can work because they are actually not on the ground themselves. They are just... Right in pots there. Hmm. So it's controlling the water distribution, yeah. which is beneficial to the plants as well. That's, it's a nice, it's all of these things that are accidental benefits, but once you recognize that they're there and you can take advantage of it, it seems like it all starts to fit together beautifully. And that for me raises the question of who is the the mastermind behind saying like what if we did this is this something that is a governmental research project or is this a university was this started by agriculture centers where maybe they were looking at from the side of the farmer where did this all start um as far as i know uh, this is a commercial uh, enterprise so okay. uh, Groenleven, uh, the, um, the company that uh, we uh, showcased, um, is, is a, a company which is already uh, doing a lot on um, sustainable energy, uh, sustainable um, uh, technology and energy production. And uh, they um, found it interesting to see if this will also work in an agricultural setting. And uh, they have engaged with the Wageningen University. Um, that's a, a well-renowned, uh, well-renowned university on agriculture, and uh, they they partnered together with the Wageningen University to to have this studied scientifically as well. Um, but it's it's just a, a commercial enterprise right. trying to 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 do this and uh, see if they can make profit uh, uh, on the long term. So th th there was no uh, government incentive here. It was not sponsored by any university. It was just <laughs> normal business. <laughs> right. It's, it's, it's energy companies recognizing there's, renewables there's like potential. wind and solar. There's a potential here, and they can make yeah. more money. And so it's, right. it's one of those aspects where this is where the free market comes in handy because it's like – it's that extra little incentive. Like right. as soon as dollar signs are seen, companies will jump in that direction. Yeah. And this goes back to something you've brought up in other videos, Matt, that there sometimes can be more positive pressure to making this kind of change when it's not coming from the environmentalist side of it. The environmentalist, there's a certain yeah. amount of white noise that comes with that where people tune it out because, oh, those tree huggers. Yes. But when it's 
uh, an energy company, and this and this ties in with something else you brought up in your video. The question of ownership of the electronic of the electricity produced and of the panels themselves, because of the layers of subsidies around the farms, and if they have to be considered a structure, and that would then undermine the subsidy. Farmers aren't going to want that. Want that unless the law is changed. Mm -hmm. So in this case, it's the panels are owned by an electric company and the electricity is owned by them and they would be paying the farmers for how would the farmers benefit from this financially, if at all. Do you want to take that, Rob? Yeah, in, in this particular case, it was very easy because uh, the farmer um, was able to sustain his business as usual. Um, mm. with uh, less troubles in maintaining um, the structures he needs for the, the growth of, of his product, of his produce. Um, so the farmer benefits uh, from having these structures. Um, his, his employees benefit from it. Yeah, they, they like to work there more than they like to work uh, under the plastic canopies because it can get very hot there. Yeah. Um, and... Um, that, that that was one of the uh, the key points. Eh? If 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 your 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 produce is less than uh, than than before, why would you even bother thinking about it? Um, right. And and that's something that the Fraunhofer Institute also uh, investigated, and they said that okay, farmers when they are owning the solar panels, um, they they can have um, uh, two kinds of products uh, on the same land. And they can have energy and they can have crops. And if, for instance, the crop yield is uh, is not as good, but they can compensate with uh, the energy yield and, and vice versa. But um, it's not uh, 100% plus 100%. So right. it, it usually boils down to 180 or 186% of what, what could be done uh, instead of uh, just using the land just for uh, crops or just for uh, for solar. Um, it, uh, what I found in my study is also that um, uh, not all farming is um, economically viable anymore these yeah. days. And mm -hmm. uh, for instance, um, uh, uh, some farmers in the UK, they have been, say, they, they say, okay, we have this land. Uh, it, it doesn't make sense to, to grow anything here. Um, let's put solar panels on it. And uh, okay, we also have some chicken and some geese. Let's uh, let's let them move around there, and uh, then we have um, a dual use uh, of, right. of this land. But that's not what we call agrivoltaics. It's it's just um, doing something extra with it. But right. they just turned from agriculture to uh, b becoming an energy farmer, <laughs> right? And th that's something entirely different, right? And and, and there's also. It's not just utilities that are doing this. Like uh, in the U.S., one of the largest agrivoltaic test centers was a. I think it's called uh, what is it called? Oh, Jack's Solar Garden. It's in Boulder, Colorado, and it's a community solar project. So it's not owned by a major electric company. It's a community community solar. So the farmer themselves is actually benefiting from the electricity generation in addition to the benefits they're getting from yeah. what they're growing. So right. there's many ways that you can handle these projects, which yeah. is the other interesting part. The, the, the Fraunhofer Institute also says well, these have uh, these projects uh, um, are are most uh, fruitful and successful if the energy which is um, generated can can be used locally mm -hmm. yeah. in, in, instead of just pushing it back to back to the grid. Uh, so those synergistic effects um, th th these are the things that. Um, make it interesting to, to, to explore these kinds of options. Yes. Yep. And when it comes to energy production, you want it to be especially fruitful on a raspberry farm. <laughs> uh, see what I, did I see there. what you yes. did there. Yes. <laughs> this it's, I think one of the, the key things that stands out for me is, is this is something that could be done globally. I, this is this is a practice, and when you talk about agrivoltaics, it, it occurred to me that the key you you pointed out the Rob the the UK example of change of land use does not make it agrivoltaic. It's 
when it's enmeshed with the actual agriculture process. Um, that seems to me like this could be done in a lot of different environments globally, but it's going to have a lot of different types of bureaucratic and governmental regulation to jump through. And it's not going to be an apples to apples comparison from somewhere in Iowa to somewhere in Europe. It's going to be each of those cases is going to be very unique. And I'm wondering, are there some crops that stand out as raspberry, the raspberry production, uh, the, the, the bush fruit um, that is referenced in that, like strawberries, where you mentioned things that would have grown naturally in wooded areas would benefit from this. Is there another crop that just stands out as like, this is clearly a crop that might benefit from this? Like, how would this interact with maybe rice production? Is a rice paddy something where you could put these kinds of panels around a rice paddy and have a similar impact? Or does there happen to be a crop that it just, oh, this could never, ever work? We already mentioned things like tree orchards and stuff like that. It's, that's a difficult question, but I've been thinking about that as well. And mm -hmm. there's one particular example which is very appealing to me. I don't know if you know anything about cotton production. Mm. Cotton is extremely water hungry. Mm. And um, I don't know if you've ever seen uh, pictures of um, the Lake um, Aral somewhere in, um, I think it was uh, uh, somewhere on the, uh, on the Asian continent. Um, I think it was uh, something between Russia and China or something like that. I'm not sure exactly where it, where it is. But that lake uh, has been drained of all water in just a few decades, just for cotton production, and now it's 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 a, a mere shimmer of what it was before. If we were able to to do cotton production uh, with fifty percent less uh, water, then uh, that entire ecosystem could recover from what it has become. So that was just one thing that I, I thought might be interesting. I, I, I just don't know enough about, uh, about those plants to, to make that judgment. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm not a biologist. So, yeah. but th that was one thing that I thought uh, that might be actually quite interesting. And there was some, th uh, someone, uh, in, in the comments on the, on the video from Nigeria who said, I live in an area where water is a problem. Uh, we yeah. have, we have lots of land. We, we, we need to feed a lot of mouths. Um, this would be an ideal solution for our growing economy. And, and they don't have existing grids that they need to adapt to. They can just build the grids around these yeah. decentralized solutions. And I, I think for those kinds of use cases and, and, and those kinds of areas, that would be an, an amazing massive. opportunity. Yeah, massive. Yeah. I, I, I don't think it's, it's a solution for every region or every crop. Yeah, I think I think that's that's uh, nonsense. Yeah. And I think the I think another benefit from this is you're talking about, as you mentioned before, these are crops that require hands on. They require there to be farm workers that are going in and harvesting these things because, in some cases, the delicacy of of the the crop itself, the the bushes that are growing these, and so it occurs to me that if you manage to make a highly productive farm that would create more jobs for people who would need to be the workers going in and working with, you know, harvesting those things. It seems to me like that's another benefit that could potentially come out of this. A less productive farm doesn't need to hire as many farm hands and somebody who's growing close to the maximum yield that they can get out of something is going to need more people. So that's another thing I think to consider. Definitely. Well, this conversation has been terrific. Rob, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you, Rob. Yeah. And thank you for all the work on the video. <laughs> uh, it, it was great fun to do it. And I learned a lot about it uh, uh, by doing it. So, And and there's one thing that I, I would like to add. I've never had the opportunity to actually uh, present a topic that I'm interested in or, or enthusiastic about to um, a half a million people. <laughs> so I'm, 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 I'm amazed by that. <laughs> so that, that, that's also uh, something that I find uh, amazing.
in this uh, in this uh, cooperation that we did. So yeah. it was a lot of fun, and uh, I was. learned a lot of. Yep. What are the next steps for you, Rob? When are you finishing up your degree? I hope to finish it uh, um, the end of next year. So I'm almost at the end of my uh, of my uh, tour, but it's all done in my spare time because I'm just a. Uh, uh, I, I'm working in in. Um, in IT consultancy for about 35 years. So, um, it's, so it's, it's really a labor of love. It's a, it's a, yeah, it's a passion exa- project for you. It, absolutely. Absolutely. That's fantastic. And I, yeah. And I hope I can finish it on, on time. Yeah. <laughs> it's always challenging. Yes. Yeah. Life gets in the way a lot of times. Yes, it mm-hmm. does. Yeah. But thank you again for joining us. This has been fantastic. You're welcome. And, uh, so our well, listeners you, should let us know what they me. think. Oh, absolutely. Our listeners should let us know what they think. And like Rob pointed out, people in different regions have been reaching out and saying this would make sense here. I'm very curious, are any of our listeners in that group, do you think that there's a place where this could fit into your local agricultural community? Let us know. You can find the contact information in the podcast description. Or if you're on YouTube, you can just scroll down below the video and leave a comment there. Don't forget, we do have a way to directly support the podcast. You can visit stilltbd.fm. You'll see the support the podcast link there. Or if you're watching us on YouTube, don't forget, there's a membership button you can press and you can make a donation directly to us here. Just press the join button and join us. Be sure to give us a rating, a review, and share us with your friends. All of that really does help the podcast. The podcast helps the channel. The channel helps Matthew. And then Matthew tries to convince the cows to stop hating so hard on (laughs) Solar. (laughs) Thanks so much for listening, everybody. We'll talk to you next time.